Okay, guys, in our previous lesson, okay, we talked about the total differential. You know, it's a quicker way for us to calculate dz, which is equal to certain partial derivatives multiplied by the quantities of delta x and delta y. But we said that for that theorem to be valid, the certain function, okay, needs to have the total differential at that turning point. Or in other words, it needs to be differentiable at the x and y, okay, at the domain of x and y. Now, we also mentioned that the partial derivative, the mere existence of the partial derivative does not lead to the total differential. Instead, the partial derivative must also be continuous throughout the domain of x and y. So from today, we extract a certain lemma from that. Okay? This lemma is what we call the fundamental lemma and it's obviously fundamental because we use it in certain theorems of advanced differential calculus. So this is what I mean. The fundamental lemma, and it says that if the z equals to the function x and y, has continuous first partial derivatives in the domain of um, x and y, which is labeled as d, then x has a differential or the total differential which is given by this over here. Okay, now, many of you might be scratching your heads and thinking, Danny, why are we spending so many lessons talking about this total differential? I keep on saying again, this is what analysis or this is what advanced differential calculus is all about. Now, before we mentioned the theorem, we said that if this function has the total differential or if you know it has if it's differentiable in the domain of x and y domain d then the total differential dz is given by this over here but this is what the fundamental uh, fundamental lemma is and it's something different it says that as long as this function has continuous first partial derivatives okay then the total differential exists and you know thereby saying that the function is differentiable so this one is really proving that the total differential exists by merely looking at the function and obviously whether it has continuous first partial derivatives, okay? Something different. So, as long as this function has continuous first partial derivatives, the total differential exists is given by that over there, um, obviously the same as, you know, the, the theorem that we saw previously, okay? And obviously at every point, x and y of d. So, this is what we want to prove, okay? Now, here's a rough uh, plan of how are we going to prove it. We just simply first need to show that this function has a total differential. Now, how do we get the total differential? Well, the, the function delta z, right, needs to take a certain form. Remember, it takes a certain form of um, a delta x plus uh, b delta y plus epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 multiplied by the certain delta x and delta y. And epsilon 1 is equal to 0 as delta x delta y tends to 0, my previous, previous definition. So, our aim is this. Given this function, let's see what we can write this delta z x. Okay, delta z x. Okay, so this is how we start. Now, let x, y be a fixed point in D, okay? Let x, y be a fixed point in D, and if x changes, okay, alone, one obtains a change in z, okay? Remember, we want to go into a certain expression of delta z. So what we're going to do now is we're going to hold y fixed, hold one of the variables fixed, which is y, and now let's change x. So, you know, let um, x change. So basically, what we have is delta z, okay? Now, a change in x, that means there will be a delta x would entail a change in z. What is that change in z? It's simply none other by this quantity over here. Okay, fixing y, so y stays the same. Okay, remember, x, y is a fixed point. Okay, and uh, the change is basically the function applied to x plus delta x minus the function applied to x, both of which we hold y fixed. Okay, this is a simple uh, definition of the change in z. Okay, and we can go from here, okay, rewriting a certain expression of this quantity over here, okay? Um, no, sorry, this quantity over here, via the mean value theorem. And the mean value theorem tells us that this delta z, so this difference, okay, when I apply, apply the function to the two points as I move from x to x plus delta x, okay, the difference can be written as the partial derivative of the function evaluated at x1 multiplied by a certain delta x. Okay, this delta x corresponds to the same delta x uh, when I change the, the x variable. Okay, and this is the partial derivative. Now, from one-dimensional calculus, this would have been the derivative. But I say again, we say partial derivatives because we're holding one of the variable fixed, we're holding y fixed. If you can't see this, basically, let's sketch this out. Our delta z is over here, okay? This change when we apply the function, okay, as we move from x to x plus delta x. Okay. And by the mean value theorem, it tells us that we want this quantity over here, right? This quantity can be calculated by multiplying this distance over here, which is delta x, by a certain partial derivative. Now, remember, derivatives always gives us the slope of the tangent. I'm not going to use this uh, slope over here, okay? It need not necessarily be that um, tangent over there, because if I use this, if I multiply this distance over here, delta x, uh, by the slope, okay, or by the gradient, I'll basically get the distance over here. It need not be this point over here. Instead, it will be the partial derivative evaluated at a certain point x1, 
which is between x plus delta x. So it could be say over here, okay, and so if I multiply the this distance over here by the gradient, okay, or the, the tangent, I will basically get this distance over here. This distance is the same distance as delta x, which is what I've written over there like so. See, the partial derivative evaluated at a certain x1 multiplied by delta x is none other than taking this x distance multiplied by the gradient, okay? Now, since the function, our uh, partial derivative of the function f in terms of x is continuous, I can write the, the difference, okay, sorry, I can write the difference of the partial derivatives, okay, as epsilon 1. Okay, why do I want to do that? Because remember, I want to try to get that form to tell me that the, the total differential exists. It's um, this one over here, okay, a delta x plus b delta y and epsilon 1 delta x plus epsilon 2 delta y. So I want to introduce this epsilon 1 over here, okay? And this epsilon 1, I want to try to introduce it in this partial derivative. So what I'm just basically writing is that epsilon 1 is equals to the partial derivative of f uh, applied to x1. Remember, x1 is between x plus delta x and subtract um, the function partial derivative evaluated at x over there. Now, this, I can substitute this, okay, back inside this over here, okay? Now, we we'll see why we want to do that, okay? Or basically, as we proceed on further, we want to do that. Now, I got a, a partial derivative in terms of x evaluated at x1. So basically, I want to write this in terms of that. Um, I just basically keep this over here and I'll bring this function over here like that. So what I'll have is this is equals to um, the partial derivative evaluated at x plus epsilon 1. Okay, I'm just basically bringing this over here. So it'll be something like that. There we go. And then now I can substitute this back inside that over there. And what I'll ultimately get is this over here. Partial derivative, okay. Um, x plus, uh, sorry, x evaluated at x and y multiplied by delta x and I'll plus the epsilon 1 multiplied by delta x. Okay, as we can see that over there. And lastly, I want to mention that notice epsilon 1, okay, which is now basically, um, yeah, epsilon 1 over here, which was defined previously as the difference of the two partial derivatives, is equal to 0 as delta x tends towards 0, okay? As delta x tends towards 0, this point gets closer and closer to this point over here. Basically, x1 is going to be equal to x. And when that happens, okay, the partial derivative at these two points are equal. So this partial derivative of this minus this is equal to 0. Epsilon 1 tends towards 0. That is important because it follows our conditions for the total derivative to exist. Now, I will change both x and y, okay? And one obtains a change in, del in delta z as given by that over there, okay? This is basically using a definition. What I started out with is that I would change z in terms of x alone, keeping y fixed. But now I'm gonna change both x and y. So, as you can see, I sketched out over here, this is the domain of d. I'm gonna move from x, y to x plus delta x, y plus delta y. Previously, I moved from here to here, but now I'm going to move from here to here because why? Remember, we always go back in changing both x and y simultaneously. I can rewrite this change in another way. What's the other way I can write? I can write first, I will experience a change in z going from this point to this point over here. As you can see, x plus delta x minus x, okay? This is the first one that we started out with. And after that, I would hold x fixed, but I will hold x fixed as x plus delta x because I went to this point over here. And then now, I will experience another change in z going from this point to this point over here, as you can see over there, okay? I'm holding x fixed now, the x coordinate, which is now x plus delta x, but I'm going to change the y coordinate. So I have a y plus delta y minus the function applied to y, okay? And then I similarly, I can also rewrite this, okay? Like what I just did, but this time I will write z as a function of y alone. Now when I do that, this quantity, okay, becomes this quantity over here, okay, similar to this quantity over there, okay? So you can see. Now this is also important because these two are valid because the partial derivative of f in terms of x is continuous, just like what we started out to say. Okay, and now finally, okay, if you are with me so far, Okay, substitute this back inside the change in delta z, what do I get? I would get this, okay? Now this, remember, delta z can be written as this over here. This, I have written it as this expression over here. Partial derivative in terms of x, evaluated x, y multiplied by a delta x plus epsilon 1 delta x. And then I will plus the, the, the other difference, which I move from x plus delta x to x plus delta x, y plus delta y. is given by that over there. So the partial derivative in terms of y, x, y multiplied by a change in y delta y plus epsilon 2 um, de, uh, delta y. And both epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 does concede 
to the condition that delta x tends towards zero, uh, delta y tends towards zero, epsilon one and epsilon two both equal to zero. And there we have just shown that the total differential does exist, and not only that, these two, the total uh, differential quantity, okay, which is this and this, is in fact the partial derivatives of the function itself. Okay, f uh, f partial derivative of f in terms of x and partial derivative of y of f in terms of y and this goes into this thing over here okay and there we go <laughs> using basic definitions to show that the total differential exists it takes this form and not only that the a and b remember a and b are the coefficients of delta x and delta y is equal to this partial derivative itself lastly i want to want to mention that it's conventional that we substitute the delta x delta y to dx dy for reasons we shall see why later okay and lastly this is just simply telling me that I see how the rate of change of z varies in terms of x and I'll multiply it by a certain change in dx and dy. Okay, so this is the fundamental lemma that I hope that I conclusively prove that we're going to use in our further concepts and theorems. Thank you.